I want to bring up a scenario that <laughs> I think um, you know comes up time to time in our field, and particularly in this setting where we're you know moving from one therapy to another, and that is the development of brain metastasis. And I bring it up because you know I you know there have been times when I've been denied you know a, an MRI to the brain for a patient. And yet, you know, I'm always concerned when I have a patient that I'm following that has a decent disease burden. Maybe they get progression into a new organ. Um, maybe they've been on a number of different therapies that, that might select for the brain as, a, as an, an organ of sanctuary, particularly IO therapy. So when, when do you image for, for brain metastasis? Is it only for symptoms or are you thinking about that as you're kind of switching from one line of therapy to another? It's a tough one. I, uh, there, there's no guideline therapy. There's no guidelines. No, no. Um, and I, I, I generally start worrying after my first two lines of therapy. Uh, I think in the last month I've had three patients who've all developed sudden onset of brain mets, all of them in that third, fourth line space. Um, and, you know, you usually can salvage them uh, with stereotactic uh, surgery or just surgery alone. Um, so I'm, I'm not, I don't feel like we're, it's not like a death sentence anymore. You know, you can, you can pick them up, but on the other hand, it's really nice to pick up a, 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 a one centimeter lesion rather than a four centimeter lesion. Exactly. That's, exactly. That, exactly. That, that's the advantage yeah. of yeah. Getting it early. When, when they're symptomatic, we're really late to the game. Yeah. And to me, if, if there's an opportunity to do that, maybe not every single time you're changing therapies, but say if it's been a couple years, yeah. to check that. Because you know, I, I think if you do, you're going to find some of these smaller incidental ones that you know, we can treat a lot easier, again, with stereotactic radiosurgery than we yeah. can systemically. That's a good, that's a good point. As good patients advice. are living longer, much longer than they used to, mm -hmm. right? Uh, we, are, we started seeing increasing prevalence of incidences of brain metastasis in our patients. And the good news about kidney cancer patients is that they usually have oligometastatic brain metastasis, using single lesion, compared to like melanoma or lung cancer with a multiple brain metastasis. And I think picking that early on gives us a chance to treat them easily when they're one centimeter in size with stereotactic radiation versus when they're four centimeter in size, as you said. So we we uh, uh, do a uh, brain MRI for all patients once a year. Uh, who, uh, any patients who do not have any uh, known brain metastasis. Even if they're not progressing? Even they're not progressing, once a year. And patients who never had brain, who have brain metastasis, obviously, you know, every three months with all right. scans. Right. Whenever right. scans are done, we repeat the brain scans. But we learned this uh, uh, hard way, like, three, four years ago, when the survival suddenly went up from, say, nine months to 18 months, and then 28 months. I think it's somewhere in the range of... 40 now, yeah. potentially, right. with some of our newer so, frontline therapies. I think it's very important to pick them up. I think histology also. I think our patients with sarcomatoid, I think I'm scanning them and every change of therapy, but I would probably scan them every six months as yeah. well, just because you expect that they're going to be a rapid progressor, and then, you know, if you don't have a good pulse with your patients, mm -hmm. then you find that they're going to just explode in front of you, unfortunately. So, Naraj, can, let's wrap up this session with a little bit of an overview of your strategy now in terms of thinking about the sequential use of therapies and, you know, how you're thinking about a patient now, say, coming off of uh, a frontline TKI. What's, what's your next move, and, and how is some of the newer data now potentially changing? Are you still going to be thinking about single-agent nivolumab in that setting? Would you think about combinations, uh, especially as, as some of that data uh, emerges and, and maybe gets into NCCN and other criteria? Yeah. So I think I'll stick to the uh, drugs which are already approved uh, to make it convenient for me. So many things are happening, and I'm sure the field is changing. Same, similar discussion we'll have next year. We'll have a very different theme and different ideas and topics. Mm -hmm. So with the current treatment options, I think there are four drugs we have. Nivolumab, cabozantinib, axetinib, and linvatinib evrolimus combination. Um, somebody progressing slowly, uh, as Dr. Vogelzang said, maybe uh, one new lesion in the liver, 
Uh, but otherwise, uh, doing uh, uh, performance status is stable, uh, no other symptoms. I think in those patients, I won't hesitate going with axitinib. Mm -hmm. uh, in patients who have high volume, relatively multiple new lesions, maybe b bone metastasis, uh, where I don't want to take a risk of uh, a drug failing in those patients, I won't hesitate in going ahead with uh, cabozantinib. In fact, cabozantinib is my favored second line treatment right now. And where is uh, the role of nivolumab? I think this answer will be much easier next year when nivolumab, ipilimumab combination gets approved. That becomes first line, and then really we don't have to worry about how to choose between nivo and cabo in second line. But for now, I think I reserve nivolumab for those patients whose disease is really indolent and very slowly progressive. I think more for those patients who I'm already considering axitinib. Uh, so those are the patients I choose nivolumab for. And then when they progress on these options, uh, my favorite uh, regimen is linvatinib with abrolimus in third line. What do you guys think? Yeah, I think so. Okay. It's a, it's a, it's a rapidly changing field. We're mm -hmm. going to be talking about the upfront uh, immunotherapies, and that'll change a lot of our discussion over the next couple of years. Okay. And then Maybe you get six to, months after. Mm -hmm. Even sooner than that. Then you get to think, let's say you have our favorable risk patient, the one who on the Checkmate 214 did better with sunitinib compared to uh, immunotherapy, um, and they get 18 months out of it. Do you then think about immunotherapy or do you now go back to the faucet of a TKI followed by a TKI? I mean, I'm not writing that study, but right. again, so thank goodness, going back to what Dr. Vung is saying, said, the embarrassment of riches is a good thing to have. It's more embarrassing than ever.